The last item on our agenda is uh, our McKinstry facility condition assessment, and I invite you, Brian, to introduce that. Yes. Uh, so our last item tonight we have uh, is regarding our f facility condition assessment, as you just articulated. So we're, <laughs> we're looking forward to hearing our third installment of the facilities condition assessment from the McKinstry team. Thank you for hanging in there with us. We know it's a late night. Uh, and here to introduce this update is our Chief Operations Officer, Mr. Jeff Connell. So, Jeff, welcome. Push the green button. So, thank you, Superintendent Kingsley, members of the board. Um, Jeff Connell, Chief Operations Officer. If the members of the country would like to come up, that would be great. Um, as you said, this is the third installment of four. The, the one after facility condition assessment will be retro commissioning. Um, and as you know, we've heard air conditioning and the solar feasibility study as well. Um, th this is their show, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and, their, and, and um, Lauren's team um, and take it away. I guess I just wanted to at least um, put out there that this, this is a tremendous amount of information, and it is a huge source of um, really actionable information for us to take and make prioritization plans to do that thing we discussed about what monies we might need from the voters, how we might best use them, um, and kind of helping us look at that worst first in terms of life expectancy. We anticipate taking this data and using our work order data and kind of combining all of those into how we create, you know, Pooter's plan of where we feel like the priorities lie and what we need to go at. So while this is really good and important information, this is a piece of information that we plan to use to help integrate into a lot of other plans we have. So with that, Lauren, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Board and everyone. We've got, you know, a good two hours. No, I'm joking. <laughs> we will try to make this as short and succinct as possible. But thank you again for having us. We are going to go through our facility condition assessment. Um, so I'm Lauren Bridgers. I'm a McKinstry Project Director over the four projects that we are doing with your school district. I've also brought with me today um, Devin Boyce. He's our Technical Services Program Man Senior Program Manager over our facility condition assessments. So today, um, we're going to give you guys just a quick overview of our studies that we've been going through, as Jeff mentioned, our project approach, how we did the FCA, uh, the scope of work going through the deliverables that we're providing to the district. And then um, those deliverables include uh, reports per each school, as well as Reveal, which is our capital planning visualization tool. So we'll go through some examples on that. You'll see some screenshots of that. And then we'll have some opportunity for Q&A. Of course, if you guys have questions in between, feel free to interrupt. We'll gladly answer those. So, um, as Jeff mentioned, this is the facilities condition assessment. That's one of four studies. We've already gone through our solar PV study and our air conditioning study, and then we'll do retro commissioning in December. And I kind of want to start with a level set for everyone on what is a facility condition assessment. So a definition, our definition, is that it's a third party evaluation, kind of a snapshot of asset condition for the purpose of data driven capital planning. And it's often used for board or sorry, for bond planning as well in support of that. So kind of what everyone has been talking about um, this evening. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Devin, who's going to talk about how we did our facility condition assessment, also known as FCA. So if you hear us saying that acronym, that is that. Thanks. All right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to start off um, talking about the overall approach. Three phases. Um, learn. We want to learn what we can about the buildings before we go in. Uh, audit and analyze. Talk about that process. And then ultimately reporting. With that learn phase, we very much want to start with the project kickoff. We want to um, interview facilities staff, again, learn what we can before we uh, walked into the buildings. Reviewing existing drawings, um, very much planning out site visits and being strategic about uh, places we were visiting. Um, that prepared us to then go and actually walk each building. Now it's time to collect the data. So we collect that field data. There was asset tagging that was also done to support maintenance activities. We start to identify priority issues, and I'll put a bit as big asterisk right there. You're going to hear me talk about priority several times. So that's the first time that it comes up. 
We also want to start calculating costs based on what it is that we see, cost to replace, cost to repair, and start estimating the remaining life for each of the assets. Um, so this is something that's generated both at the asset level and at the system level. Then when we get to reporting, there are two ways that this information is provided back to the district. Certainly we have reports. Um, these are going to be summary narratives that describe each system within each building, and I'll show an example of those. Uh, and then ultimately there's the data. And this is the hard data. So this is your data. This will be present in Reveal, but it doesn't live only in Reveal. It is very much available to be uploaded, to be part of CMMS. There isn't anything in here that can't be exported and that you can use outside of this system. This is very much just a, a tool for planning. Um, so then looking at that next step. So this is not something that's part of McKinstry's scope, but this is very much the, the next step to having high-performing buildings looking at those prioritized capital plans that were mentioned before, and align that with maintenance operations. So you have a combined capital plan and a maintenance plan that are working together to support your facilities. Uh, the final part there is to update that information and keep that information live. Regular app, uh, updates based on asset lists, um, construction that has been completed, maintenance that has been performed, you can constantly keep that information up to date and, and actionable. Um, okay. So uh, when we talked about priority, or when I mentioned priority earlier, um, this is the, the scale for reference. So think of it as uh, green to red. What we're looking at here is from an impact perspective, is this low impact or is this high impact? So you see the numbers go from 6 to 30, and I'll, I'll show the numbers here in a second. But uh, just at a high level, that's the, the, the concept here is green is a lower impact, lower priority, and red is higher impact, higher priority. So the factors that we used when we're assessing each asset, of course, asset condition. This is a condition assessment. And we're looking at the observed remaining life. What is the time frame that that asset is going to need to be replaced? But beyond that, there are other factors that we can use or that you can utilize as part of your planning process. So looking at the replacement cost, we can prioritize things that are a uh, higher cost. Um, student teacher impact, which are the assets that are directly student facing? You can uh, prioritize those as well. Um, operating impact, what's the impact to operations in the building? Uh, and energy impact, is this an asset that is a significant energy consumer? Um, the way that each of those is then applied to each asset is in this range from one to five. So low score, a one, excellent condition, minimal impact up to a five. Very poor condition or most severe impact. So from that perspective, you can think of it almost like golf, right? Low score is better, uh, high score is what you want to try to stay away from. The reality is that there are some assets that are going to score high in this uh, methodology by default because they're always student facing, they're always you know, life safety issues, things like that. And that's okay because that's the idea is that they bubble to the top. Okay, so the scope of work. So uh, this is all, all laid out also in the um, uh, agenda for the meeting, um, but two general groups of asset types, so architectural and uh, structural assets, general foundation, right, structural issues, uh, windows, doors, roof, walls and flooring, uh, and that's just uh, examples, those are the, the big items. Um, in addition, mechanical electrical plumbing, so these are all the mechanical systems. Boilers, pumps, elevators uh, are part of that. Uh, switchboards, lighting, fire protection. Uh, I spe specifically call out the walk-in freezers. That was something that is not typically included in, in an assessment, but it was something that you had specifically called out. So that is part of our assessment. Um, and obviously other smaller pieces that go along with that. So the list is long, but these are the high points. I do want to call out types of assets that were not included in our McKinstry study. Um, things like pavements, uh, hard surfaces that are surrounding the buildings, uh, playgrounds, ball fields, irrigation systems, um, and then any uh, furniture fixtures and equipment, FF&E, desks, things like that that would be located inside the school. Now that's not to say that those are not being considered by the district. Those funds or those costs are just being determined outside of our study. Um, so the information that was collected for each of the assets then it, within that scope of work. Uh, name of the asset, uh, category or system, uh, type of asset, uh, make model serial. These are all the, the bits of information that are collected. An asset tag number, if there's an existing tag, if we applied a tag, that's now documented. Date of installation and then physical location. So we'll have a floor plan with a pin uh, that uh, shows the exact location of that asset. The types of assets that were tagged. Um, 59 unique types. We went through this uh, in an exhaustive fashion uh, with staff. In the end, uh, a little over 4,400 individual assets were tagged out of a total of over 11,000 assets that were part of the assessment. 
um, primarily big units, boilers, chillers, AC units, certainly switchboards, distribution panels are typical for getting tagged. Um, but there were some smaller assets that would not be tagged. Just because it's a fan doesn't mean that it gets tagged. Sometimes things are not necessarily maintained, they're just repaired by replacement because the cost is too small. So that's generally the list of what got tagged. All right, so now the information that's collected. So this is the first time you'll see a glimpse of the reveal uh, tool. So here we see uh, a bunch of boxes, right? They all say RTU on them and there's different colors. So I'm, I'm going to highlight that for just a second. That is looking at priority, not necessarily condition. So this is a good example of we have similar types of assets that may be serving different aspects of the school. Maybe it's student facing. Maybe this is a smaller capacity or a smaller cost item. This is an example of how that prioritization can be visualized. The data behind each of these individual boxes is shown here. Um, you see the subsystem. You see the year that something is installed. Uh, an industry life remaining, an observed remaining life as well. Um, you'll notice that that industry life is negative. That means that that particular asset has exceeded its industry life. It is beyond what it is, has, beyond the life it is expected to have. Um, based on how we observe it operating, based on discussions with maintenance staff, we estimate that that will continue to operate for four more years beyond today. Um, so I'm going to come back to, to that um, a, a little bit more in a second. Um, again, for that particular asset, you can see the real estimate replacement cost uh, size. The, the link there is a, a link to that floor plan that I was mentioning and uh, photographs of that asset, and then the asset tag number that was identified for that specific asset. So that's there for each of the boxes that you'll see in Reveal as I start uh, giving another example. Okay. Um, so the report. So we talked a little bit about the data that's out there for all of those assets. Um, the report. So the format for each school starts with an executive summary. All of these assets we have replaced on a certain schedule, and so we're looking at a three-year time horizon, a five-year time horizon, and a ten-year time horizon. What are the assets that are included in each of those time frames? And that's broken out by, um, by cost and by system for each school. So you can see what that looks like in the near term, medium term, and the long term. In addition to that, we do have system descriptions. So this talks about the condition of the overall system in that school, as well as the observed remaining life um, and overall priority for that system in that school, using, again, these factors that we've talked about. Um, and finally, the report includes recommended projects. So this is not the same necessarily as priority projects. These are just projects that we've identified. Um, fire life safety, obviously those are going to be recommended when we identify those. Engineering judgment could result in a recommended project if we see that there's an asset that is obsolete uh, or if for some reason there may be a future issue, we may recommend that it get replaced before it reaches the end of life. Um, and then certainly ratings and scoring. So at the end, when we talked about all of those six parameters, we'll look at all of those, bring those together, and then say, based on that, this is where we see the, the, um, the priorities uh, falling. Now, these are just our recommendations, right? Certainly the district is going to make its own findings and recommendations, and this is the, the tool that we have created here for you to use is exactly that. It, it is a tool. Um, and so you'll ultimately arrive at whatever is an appropriate set of priorities uh, and recommendations for the district. Okay, so how do you do that? How can you utilize that information? So the first thing, looking at identifying those end-of-life assets. Um, so this is a, a one of the views within Reveal, uh, and I want to highlight that industry remaining life again. So on average, all the assets that we assessed uh, have exceeded their life by 2.6 years. So again, that's on average. Um, looking at the observed remaining life, how, li how long do we think those assets will continue to operate based on current maintenance, is a little over five years. So the fact that it's negative is not because assets have not been replaced because of maintenance uh, not happening. The deferred maintenance came from budgetary constraints. They recognized those things were due to be replaced, but they just did not have the funds to make those replacements. So they did what they could to keep the, the assets running and extend that life. So um, kudos to them, but that, that's why there is such a significant difference there. Um, ultimately, 
this, after identifying the end of life assets, now you can start to complement the existing planning systems. So we talked about different priorities and different factors. The idea of having all of this data here is to have, to avoid any singular priority from driving overall facility um, construction or, or tasks. The idea is that's going to change over time. So let's see how those different priorities shift. Does that even influence the decisions that you make? Um, a fact-based methodology, making sure that this information that you have, you can see, yes, either it's student-facing or it's not. Um, it's a fire life safety issue or it's not. Um, these are things that you can always reference back to say, how am I going to prioritize? What is the effect of this asset on this school? Forward-looking strategies. You have, again, this is a 10-year outlook. So you have this ability to see what it is that's going to be coming in the future, what that cost is going to be. Um, this uh, will be broken out, obviously, by uh, school, so you can compare one school to another, but very much about what is it that's coming? What, are the, what is that next thing that we're going to have to worry about? And then finally, evaluating alternatives. Um, what is it, if we do this, what is, the, you know, do X, what is the thing that we're not going to get to do because we ha don't have the funding to do that? You can compare those scenarios to say, what does it look like if I take this building completely out of the mix? Or what if I plan on some Band-Aids for this building right now because I need this to go five more years? Whatever those scenarios are, the idea is that this tool can help ad adapt to that and show you what the impacts of that are going to be. Because ultimately, you need to have a plan that supports adaptation, right? Things are going to break when you don't expect them to break and to know what the effect of that is going to be, where, where the dominoes that are going to happen after that break, this is uh, something that the tool can, can provide. Okay, so I know you want to know a, a condition. Show me, show me conditions. So if we look at that 10-year range, if we limit our, to, just to the assets that reach the end of life in the next 10 years, each of these boxes represents one of those assets that I showed as a rooftop unit as an example. Um, so red being the poorest condition to orange then to yellow and yes there are actually some green items out there because not everything lasts 50 years so over 10 years you will eventually get to those assets as well so that's generally what it looks like in 10 years but that's just looking at asset condition it's really hard to prioritize based on all that red and orange and yellow so what we can do is start to layer in additional factors so now what I've done is gathered this, this is still in the re same reveal dashboard, the same data points, um, but I've grouped those by asset type and now added in student impact. Which are the assets that are going to um, impact students the most? So things like exhaust fans sort of fall down, um, some of the rooftop units, some electrical panels, lighting starts to, to crop up, um, certainly fire alarms, fire suppression, right, those are the red boxes that jump out at you. Um, but that's still a lot of, of, a lot of yellow. Um, if we do it again, and now let's say, let's factor in energy impact. So if we look at just those three things, overall condition, impact on students, and energy consumption, what are the assets now that are our priorities? And that's where now you can see rooftop units and lighting, those bubble up over some of the other uh, HVAC components. Uh, air handlers, boilers, those still crop up to the top. And you'll say, wait a minute, I already know you're looking for fire alarms. Why is that orange now, right? Because it's not an energy consuming system. So the system will show that. You can still put your thumb on the scale and say, well, obviously we're going to do that. Let's take that out of the consideration. After fire alarms, what's my priority? Um, and if we put all the factors back in, weight them all equally, all six, this is what that looks like. This is that overall priority. So prioritizing fire protection, heat generating, cooling, that's not a surprise. Distribution systems, again, that's a lot of the existing HVAC or um, uh, air moving components, terminal and package units, the electrical box, the, the third yellow box there, that's predominantly lighting. So that's how that plays out based on all those priorities. Again, this is us including all of those factors. This is now up to the district to say, how do you want to balance those? What do you want to include? Um, an example then, now that you have all of those priorities, let's just pick three schools. So this is real data for three schools. Um, and to be able to compare one over the other, some years there's going to be greater need at one school over another. This is where the prioritization can come in to say, is this a small cost but a high priority? Or is this something that can actually be pushed out into a future year because we recognize there's going to be budget constraints? You can have those, that level of, of planning uh, as part of this process. 
Um, okay, so now we've had that snapshot, all the data. We see how that boils down at the individual buildings. Now it's time to roll it up. Drum roll. No. Okay, um, baseline capital need. So um, over that 10 years, if we add up all those assets that need to be replaced, $362 million. Wait, I heard, I heard a billion dollars earlier. What this is is basically the list price. Um, what, uh, I'm going to kind of jump down here to the end about things that are excluded. Um, extra abatement, design, all those other project costs that would go on top of all of that. The way the methodology works within the tool is that you can move things forward and back, and the cost at that point is going to be the same. It's ultimately when you decide, I'm going to execute this project in three years, now I want to add three years of inflation onto it. Um, you can make those decisions. What is it you think is a reasonable amount for inflation? How much do you include in your process for design? I don't want to tell you this is what it should be. Um, I can say that on average, we will typically, based on experience, add 70% to the base costs. And that's when you start getting to that, um, that ballpark. Um, so add 70% on top of that, 362, that gets us over 600. Talk about the assets that we did not include. Um, that's going to bring that number up, and then once you put inflation, you're probably going to be even north of a billion dollars. But again, that depends on when you're actually executing that work to know what that cost is going to be. Um, one thing I'll mention, too, is that this is like-for-like -like replacement. So this assumes that you're replacing exactly what you have with another one of exactly what you have, just a new version of it. So you'll have those scenarios where you'll say, I know what I have is outdated. I'm going to replace it with... Uh, a new AC system or some other new assets or new system design. This is still going to be the baseline to say if all you do is just take care of what you have, that's still going to cost you a million dollars, X dollars. So you're not talking about spending um, the entire design money to uh, replace that. It's really about saying, I'm already spending a million dollars, right? I know that I have to spend that much. How much is the incremental amount to get that superior building, to get to that AC system, that sort of thing? Um, so sample uh, at the, the system level. So if we were to look at this analysis, um, I talked about lighting being a, one of those boxes. So that amounts to $64 million over the 10 years. So that becomes a group. How do we address that lighting as a program or as a package? Is there a way that we can come up with an alternative to still address that need? Fire protection, that's an example, $42 million uh, in need over the 10 years. That's a system where you can come back and have the authority having jurisdiction. Basically, fire engineers come back and recertify the systems. We have them modeled here as needing complete replacements because that's how you can plan it. But there are ways that you could instead uh, avoid having to uh, make a complete full replacement of the system. Um, and then finally, those RTUs and existing air handling units, that's another $34 million in need over 10 years. Again, that's, that's the existing that you have. Um, so are there ways that you could be more energy efficient with those particular assets? Are there opportunities there? Again, this is where we can start talking about a, a program, right? What does that uh, sequence of replacement look like? What does that look like? And which buildings would be most affected by that? All right. A question from DJ. Yeah. With uh, your graphic, <clears throat> actually, even if you go back to like uh, slide 12 or, yeah, 12. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know which one oh. 12 is, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, dis district overview, condition, student impact, and energy <laughs> impact. Yeah. The, can you clarify then, I'm not clear like why the boxes are different sizes and uh, how come, you, you know, red can pop up over there, how, how it's uh, yes. oriented across the page, I guess. Yeah, in my haste, I neglected to describe a tree map. Um, so this tree map is a way of showing, it's a, called a tree map, and it shows two different variables at the same time. So the size of the box is really the count, the number of assets that you have. And then the color of the box is its priority score, or where it falls in that range from red to green. So you have larger boxes because there are more of them. There's more exhaust fans, more rooftop units, that sort of thing. Um, and those little tiny boxes down in the lower right that we can't see the labels, um, those are assets that there just aren't that many of them. And is there a difference why, like, when you go to, so then the next slide, basically, then the red is all up in the corner, and then you go down to, to green. So how are they positioned across? 
So here I've sorted them based on size. Okay. So it's just bigger boxes in the upper left, lower boxes in the lower right. Okay. And now this is sorted by color. So that you have okay. the higher priorities in the upper left and lower priorities in the lower right, but the box size remains the same. And the box size is, is how many of them, not the cost of it. Correct. Okay. That is another um, option within the tool, however, is that you could have the size of the box is the cost of the assets. Thank you. Yeah, I, had, uh, I, I just had one more. On your slide about uh, what's titled Reveal Bond Planning, I'm looking at the 362 million over 10 years, and then your note underneath that says 70%. The, all these things can add 70%. When I add 70, when I take 70% mm -hmm. over the 362, I get about 600 million. And yet you threw out the billion dollar number. So I'm trying sure. to figure that out. Can you explain that to me, please? Absolutely. So in addition, there are the assets that are not included in the McKinstry scope. So that's going to be the hardscape, playgrounds, things like that. Um, that's not $400 million yet, but that's certainly a factor. Um, on top of that is when you add inflation. So um, when you decide, is something going to be you know, a project in year five versus year seven, um, that represents a pretty significant cost increase year over year. Thank you. I just want to be clear about that because I Absolutely. can easily see a member of the community looking at this slide going, oh, this says $600 million. What are you doing asking for a billion, yeah. right? So if you could make this clearer on that, uh, I think it would be helpful to the community to really understand the costs. Okay. I think Brian's going to do some clarification about what he's saying, too. Yeah, so, so thank you for the question, and thank you for helping provide that deeper level of clarity. My understanding is that these dollars do not include the summation of the other studies that you've also conducted, if that's correct, the air conditioning mm -hmm. uh, feasibility, the solar feasibility, um, missing something, the potential of needing to renovate retro buildings. Yeah, retro, the retro commissioning, mm -hmm. those particular things, that's all in addition to this to Director Brogish. Is that accurate? That is correct, yes. Thank so you. If, if we were to extend that time period out from 10 years to 15 years, then that number would include the replacement of all of that new AC equipment that's installed. It's, it's being modeled here as having been installed in 2025, but you would start to see, and in fact, if you go out that far, you'll start to see multiple replacements of, of things that don't have that long of a life, but reach the end of life twice. Oh, actually, sorry. So actually, mm -hmm. as a point of clarification on what you just said, you're in your, in this analysis, of the air conditioning units, um, there's an assumption that more are put in by 2025? And if you want to yeah. answer that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, no. Okay. And, and we'll, I've got, we've got a slide on it, but yeah. if You've we want to nice. pause. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can, no, we can, we can wait. That's fine. That's okay. fine. Well, I was just going to say, if there aren't any other questions, we can jump to that. But if there are other questions for Devin before we jump to that. Uh, it doesn't look like it from okay. the board. I guess I'll just say that that while the need may be approaching or over a billion dollars, I don't think you're going to be asking for a bond for a billion dollars. So <laughs> there's going to be need to be do some prioritization against all that stuff. So mm -hmm. anyway, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. All right. So um, as Devin was mentioning, we have modeled right now in the reveal dashboard the AC studies, the high cost for the AC schools um, in being installed in 2025 and the solar being installed in 2025. That does not mean that the cost currently is in 2025. And again, it doesn't mean that that's actually happening in 2025. We just modeled it that way to be clear with everyone, like these are all in 2025. And as you can see from that visual, the kind of our second bullet points here, the replacement costs for these, which are actually just the costs that we have presented thus far, show up in year 15 for the AC, which is 2040, and then for the solar, they show up in year 25, so 2050. So what the district can do is within the re reveal dashboard, you can move around when the replacement costs actually occur. And so you can do that if you guys have a school, you're like, oh, let's see what it looks like if we actually put um, you know, we do these different replacements at these different schools, and then we add AC into this school in, you know, whatever year you would like, you can pull that forward. And so we strategically put everything as being modeled as installed in 2025 
to really show this, okay, year 15, that's huge. That's going to be a trigger to everyone to remember, oh, it's huge because we have these dummy AC assets in there, um, and we need to move those around as we're doing our actual planning. And so when you do come to that point, when you are saying, okay, we do, we've decided we want to put AC into this school, we can help advise on which existing HVAC assets would no longer then need to be replaced because you're going to be putting AC into that school, and we can take those boxes boxes out, like he was saying. Um, so that's something that we are very much um, willing to assist with. And then there's the last piece we'd like to mention is that if a school currently has AC, then the cost to replace those assets associated with AC in that school are currently included with wherever their lifespan is. So we went out and assessed, you know, the chillers that are in your district already, and those are in there based on the condition that our team saw. So just wanted to clarify that. And again, this was, we know that there was a big interest on how these studies all interact. So this was a, a direct response to making sure that we had all this data in one place. Um, and this is how we kind of, with the facilities team, decided this is the best way to model it for now. Yeah, I, and I just want to get a further clarification. If no additional AC units are put in and there's no solar that's installed. And I'm not saying that's a decision or a direction. First of all, I'm not going to be involved in it. And secondly, th there's a lot of discussion that has to happen. But if that, those conditions happened, then the current study through year 10 is, and the costs associated are indicative of the current state of the system. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think we've got just one more slide. So again, kind of reiterating what Jeff said, that the plan is for you guys to take this tool, um, add it in with your other tools, and kind of create that five and 10 year maintenance plan. And just to reiterate one more time, this is just one study um, of our McKinstry studies, and we will be back again in December to report on our last one. Any final questions? Excellent. Are there, the, Nate? And can you remind us what the scope of the last one is? Yeah. Please. Of course, yeah, so that's our retro commissioning study. So we've been working very closely with your facilities team throughout. Our teams are going out there primarily using your building automation systems to kind of see how we can optimize um, the systems that are currently out there. Again, it's a, it's a huge collaborative effort. We meet bi-weekly with the facilities team to go through the things that our team has noticed, get input to say, oh yeah, that override is in, the, the, in place for this particular reason and, and talking through all of those things. And then collaboratively have been coming up with the, the, with things we want to implement to actually optimize those systems. Um, and it's a, a great partnership with Efficiency Works, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, they're helping to fund that portion of the project. Other comments or questions from the board? DJ. This is a very pressing one. Uh, one of your team members is missing, and so I was wondering what the effect of uh, No Shave November is, if he's got a different mustache, if it's all the way. That is a great question. You know, I haven't actually seen him on team, so we'll have to ask. <laughs> it changes week to week. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments? It looks like not, in which case I want to thank you very much for all the work that you've done in the three reports uh, that you've shared with us. I think that's going to be very helpful. Actually, I do have, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so thank you, but I have a question for Jeff. And that is, they've done all this uh, inventorying of current assets. As we put new assets into the system, uh, do we have a process in place to get them into reveal and asset tagged as appropriate and all the good stuff? Well, yes and no, right? Because our existing work order system uh, which Devin mentioned, is a, a CMMS, a computerized mm -hmm. ma you know, maintenance management system. That's where we want this information to live. The reveal database is a good tool as it stands, but our hope is to take the condition assessment data, move it into our CMMS, so that our work order data also helps inform what's going on with any given asset. And so then when we work on any asset or change it, or you know, do something um, to alter it, that work gets recorded in our work order database. And that's where we would want to 
do the planning from, if you will. So we, we will create the five and 10 year maintenance plan using the reveal database and our work order database. But ultimately, reveal is more of a visual, you know, to me, it's a visualization tool to help us prioritize and have a, a you know, a snapshot of the condition of our major assets. Um, where that data lives is gonna be in our work order system. Can, so the, but can the answer we take, is yes. Can we take our data from the work order system and put it, the new, see what I'm concerned about is that the information that we'll have will get stale over time, right? Yeah. Because, because we'll add new assets, we'll replace assets, whatever. I understand that's gonna be in the work management system. I get that part. And fine, if the work management system is going to be updated and, and particularly if it allows you to then visualize the result in a reveal or somewhere, that's a cool thing. But I'm just trying to understand how we're going to keep the system up to date. Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, different frequencies of update with various clients. It can be really as often as you would like. Um, as often as you need to redo capital planning or review your capital plan. So if that's on an annual basis, that's most common. Um, we've also have some clients that want to do that quarterly because they've had that many updates and they want to just keep things that that fresh. It's really about a cost benefit on, on your part. And there, I assume from what you're saying that there's no way to just move the data back from CMMS to the reveal thing. Yes. Yeah, it, it is that. The difference is that when it moves over to reveal, then there are some additional data points that we need to assign. We need to revise pricing, for instance, mm -hmm. um, if there's a size difference, those okay. kinds of things. So there's some QC that goes along with it. DJ? I'll, I'll add one more thing. So okay. it is kind of like you're mentioning, we can, the data that we're providing is in reveal, but it's also in Excel workbooks that you guys have access to right now. Those Excel workbooks can go into your CMMS. Or you can do it the other way, like Devin was mentioning, your CMMS data can go into Reveal. Um, so it, it is both backwards and forwards compatible. Okay, so I assume then, Jeff, the intent, regardless of where the data lives, is to keep the asset list and its condition up to date. Is that correct? Correct, and you know, our, our, our CMMS is also going to have the ability to interact with Microsoft BI and Tableau and other visualization mm -hmm. tools that we can also use to look at our assets and their conditions and where things are at. Cool. DJ, did you have something else? Yeah, I just want a clarification because you kind of went around about, uh, do you have a system, Jeff, do you have a system in place that for new items we are tagging it and having it to be, you know, scanned and be able to monitor and keep track of them through. Yeah, in fact, this is this is the benefit of having McKinstry have done this kind of initial work for us, is they've created a QR code system that we can continue to use. So Perfect. as we that's replace what, assets, that's what we would do. That's, thank you. Great. So any other last minute comments? It looks like not. So again, thank you very much for the work that you've done and for all three presentations and the new board I'm sure will be looking forward to the fourth and then there'll be some challenging planning that goes on after that. So thank you very much.